is brought to you by Head Start Basketball. Hey, Hoopheads, save $3,500 on the Dr. Dish CT Plus and score free custom graphics during Dr. Dish Basketball's Push Beyond sales event. Shop this exclusive offer now until March 31st while supplies last. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoopheads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Those are some great deals, Hoopheads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. Hi, this is Coach Pascal Meurs from Belgium, and you're listening to the Hoopheads podcast. Hey, coaches, we know you're invested in the next generation of athletes. So why not give them the star treatment this season with Game Changer? Introducing Game Changer a free app that provides you with data to make strategic coaching decisions and to deliver memorable moments to your team and its fans. Engage your players, empower your coaching decisions, and give parents the thrill of watching every play unfold in real time this season. Download Game Changer now on iOS or Android. Game Changer equips your team with the tools they need to succeed. Download it today and make this season one for the books. Game Changer. Stream. Score. Connect. Learn more at gc.com slash hoopheads. That's gc.com slash hoopheads. Prepare like the pros with the all-new FastDraw and Fast Scout. FastDraw has been the number one play diagramming software for coaches for years. You'll quickly see why Fast Model Sports has the most compelling and intuitive basketball software out there. For a limited time, Fast Model is offering Hoopheads listeners 15% off Fast Draw and Fast Scout. Just use the code HHP15 at checkout to grab your discount, and you'll be on your way to more efficient game prep and improved communication with your team. Fast Model also has new coaching content every week on its blog, plus play and drill diagrams on its play bank. Check out the links in the show notes for more. Fast Model Sports is the best in basketball. Hello and welcome to the Hoopheads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here without my co-host Jason Sunkel tonight, but I am pleased to welcome in for triple double number eight, Rob Brost, head boys basketball coach at Bolingbrook High School. Rob, welcome to triple double number eight. Man, I, I can't believe it's number eight already. And you know, we're gonna have to pull on the on the ropes without Jason, but I think we can get it done. I think we can do I it. I think so. We're gonna try. So I don't know if we have to call it the the double, triple, the triple, single, the I don't, I'm not sure what I'm not sure we have to rename it, but we're gonna go with triple double number eight. All right. So let's start out. Topic number one postseason player meetings. How do you approach those? both with returning players, with seniors who are graduating? What are some of the things that you like to touch on? Just talk a little bit about how you handle the postseason meetings. Yeah. First off, I think it's vital to have them and um, to give players voice to whatever they deem necessary. And obviously, you have uh, topics that you're going to cover, but uh, a lot of times those things will go uh, into other things and other areas as well. Um, we're fortunate to, that I, I think I have a pretty good handle on where our players are mentally and and how they feel um, in general um, because we, you know, communicate so much during the season. However, the postseason meeting is is a good time to obviously review everything that happened what went well, what didn't go so well, um, to get feedback from players. How can I coach you better? Uh, what do you need to work on? Uh, what is your plan between now and November to become whatever it is that you want to become? And so obviously that's part of the topic as well. And so I think to set out a plan for all, all of the, all of the guys, whether they're, uh, returners, whether they're seniors. Um, a lot of times our seniors have already 
you know, figured out where they're going to school and all of those things by the time the season's over. So typically I like to have our underclassmen have their meeting first because, uh, you know, those guys are going to be back and they, they got to get back to work like immediately uh, on what we need to do. And then the seniors um, need to get to work on whatever it is that they need to do for their programs that they're going to after playing for us. And so uh, I, I think they're certainly valuable. Um, I know some coaches, I don't know if dread them is the right word, but uh, the the time that it takes to um, do them and have them is certainly valuable to me as a coach because I always tell them the more I know from you, the better I can coach you. And the more you know from me, the harder and better you can play for me. And and then, you know, our relationship is not transactional um, or it's less transactional. You know, I'm not just trying to get good play out of them and they're not just using me because I'm the coach. Um, and so, you know, those things are important to build throughout the season, obviously, but the postseason meetings are critical because it gives a launching pad uh, to maybe some kids that didn't play as much or didn't play at all uh, and lets them know kind of where they're at and then what kind of plans you have for them. And so for us specifically, the end of March to November is really critical in their development, specifically individually. And so that's a critical time to get a plan together as to what they're going to do. And everybody's is a little bit different depending on what travel team you're playing with. Maybe you're not playing travel, um, you know, what our summer schedule is going to look like, all of those things. And every player is a little bit different because every player is kind of in a little bit different spot, if that makes sense. Does. Do you come in with written notes? that kind of guide you through what you're doing? And then do you take notes during the meeting to kind of keep an eye on what the conversation is all about or how do you approach that? Yes. So what I typically do to drive the start of it is tell me what was good about the season, what you liked, what went well for you individually. And that's how we start, start all really all of them. And so then we get going on that. And then I say, what would you have liked to have seen work better or done differently for you as an individual. Then the same question comes about the team. And then we talk about how I can help them get better prepared, how I can coach them better and what do they feel like they need individually from me. And so that's for me personally, that's the best part of these meetings because you know, they are free to say whatever they want, just like I'm free to say whatever I want. And so um, it's really good. And especially for young people to have a discussion of of, about some things that maybe didn't go exactly how you wanted them to go. And every single player, no matter how much they play, wants to play more. And every single player wants to do more. And so it's good to have those conversations and it's good for them to be able to frame what they want and articulate what they would like to see happen. And then we articulate together what it's going to take for all of that to actually happen. A, A lot of people can articulate it, but then they can't, they don't follow it up with the work that it's going to take to make that happen. And so it's, it's just a good way all the way around to help our guys one learn communication skills with someone that's not their peer um, and that someone that is kind of, uh, I don't want to say in charge of them because it's more a team effort than it is me being the boss of them, but somebody that's kind of an authority figure that they trust, hopefully, <laughs> um, to help them uh, get where they want to go. And, and then obviously we talk about things that are completely unrelated from basketball, their families, their academics, their social situations, you know, boyfriends, girlfriends, all of those things, you know, what's going on with their extended family. Um, so those types of things we always cover as well, because that some, not, not sometimes, all the time is more important than the basketball piece. And, and again, the more I know about them, the better I can coach them. And the more they know what I'm thinking, the better they can play. You reference the meetings. When I think of 
a postseason meeting and I think about sitting down and you talked about how, okay, we have some ideas about what it's going to take to get you from A to B, but there's a lot of action that needs to be taken based on those ideas that come out of the meeting. So when you get to July and you're having a conversation with a kid and you can reflect back on, hey, during our March meeting, we yeah. talked about if you want to get to point X on our team, these were the things that you were going to have to had to do. And maybe those things, hey, they are getting done and I'm seeing the results or, hey, are those things that we talked about, are we getting those things done? Because I'm maybe not seeing the results. Is that something that you refer back to over the course of that time from March to November? Yeah. I think when necessary, we refer back to it. Um, one of the things that the meetings help with as well is this. You can do all of this stuff and still you might not play because at our place, as it is at most places, everybody is working and everybody is working really hard. So I think sometimes kids get a false sense of, hey, if I do this, it will guarantee me to get this. And so when we're talking about the things they need to do, they need to do those things. And then ultimately, they need to be better than the other guys that are on the team <laughs> that are also doing most of those right. things. Now, some of them do them harder, more often, better, with higher intensity, all of those things. Um, and then some kids, let's face it, basketball is not an equal opportunity thing. Some kids are just better than other kids. That's just the way it is. Just like, you know, some coaches are better than me. That's just the way that it is. I could work at it my whole life. I'm not going to be, you know, the best coach on the planet. Um, and so, you know, I, I think when kids start to understand that, that they should just do the work and trust the work as hard as that is, especially with social media and all of that, and not be transactional with the work, um, that's when it all starts to come together. And so, we talk about things like until you start becoming a better person, you're never going to start becoming a better player. So you got to, for example, when you're working out and you're working out with another player, you got to help that player too. And so, you know, your shine isn't less because they get a little. And so your piece of the pie isn't any less because they got a little pie too. And so, um, you know, if, if you're getting better and you're helping your team getting better, teammates get better, then we're all getting better. And that's the ultimate goal that, you know, you want your kids to understand. And that's really, really hard in this day and age because everybody wants to get theirs and wants this from social media and that uh, thing and these offers and that offer. And why is this kid getting offers and I'm not? And, you know, uh, all of those things play into the pantheon of stuff that we have to deal with these days. Uh, but all of those things are good things, I think, if you can frame them in a certain way. Yeah, it's almost like you frame it in reverse where the hard work and all that action, it doesn't guarantee you what you want. But on the other hand, if you don't do any of those things, you got there's no a shot. guarantee. Right. There's, yes. a there's, a there's a guarantee going the other way that if you don't do, the, do those things, that your opportunity is not going to be there. Right. And, and it's, you know, we have some young kids that are pretty good players um, and some young kids that are in eighth grade that are going to be with us next year. And kids tend to see the players that are ahead of them, but they don't tend to think about the players coming behind them that yeah, might absolutely. be better than them. And so, you know, it gives me a chance to say, hey, this is what's coming as well. I'm not saying Jimmy or Joey is better than you, but I am saying he's pretty talented. So you you got to think of the things like, okay, these seniors are graduating, but then we got these guys coming from the freshman team, these guys coming from eighth grade, and these guys coming from the sophomore team. They're going to play into this thing too because they want a little bit of this top five team you know, trap, you know, all the stuff that we get to do. So, um, you know, I, I think the postseason meetings are good. Um, but the best part that comes from them is the work, 
that everybody needs to commit to. And so, you know, we don't do a lot of stuff as a team between now and June 1st when our summer stuff starts. Most of what we do as individual because everybody's with their travel team or everybody's with their, you know, AU squad two times a week. So, you know, we set out what we want to have them do or what they need to work on to get better. And then in a large part, it's up to our players to make that happen. Yeah, absolutely. So you give them a blueprint of, hey, here's what we think needs to happen. You kind of put that together with the player. And then obviously it's up to the player to execute that plan with your guidance and somewhat motivation being there trying to help the player to to get to where to get to where they want to go. So my last question on this topic actually kind of leads into the second topic. So in the course of your career through these postseason meetings, you talked about how one of the questions that you like to ask is how can I coach you better? What could I have done better to help you to be a better player? So has there been something that's come out of a postseason meeting and maybe not just with an individual player, but something that you heard from multiple players, maybe over a a series of years that you've taken and said, hey, I really have to get better at that. And then that kind of leads into the second topic, which is how do you, so we talked about how you deal with and talk with the players after the season is over, but obviously Mm -hmm. you're also having a conversation with yourself of, hey, how'd the season go? What do we need to do to get better? What do I need to do to get better? How can I do things differently? So have players brought you things that you've learned from and then incorporated into who you are as a coach? And then just kind of at the end of your season, how do you go about self-reflecting on what's just taken place? Well, I think it, you know, I'll get to how I self-reflect, you know, the second part of the question here in a second, but the players are usually pretty honest with me. Um, Not usually, I think almost always are pretty honest with me. Uh, And that in and of itself tells me I'm doing a decent job because they, they trust me and they trust that I'm not going to freak out no matter what they say. And I'm not because I've been doing this long enough. Like they could say literally whatever they wanted uh, (laughs) to me and it it would be fine. But then I have, I'm going to respond to what they say as well. And I think, when players are younger, this is just what I've noticed in general. They think like, coach, I want you to push me harder. I want you to push me harder. I want you to push me harder. And then by the time they're seniors, they realize that they have been pushed (laughs) pretty hard. And that part of my thinking is the mesh point between rest, keeping everybody fresh, and getting everybody ready, especially at the end of the season, because these meetings take place towards the end of the season. While the last month of practices, at least for us, are relatively the same. We shoot, we do transition progression, we go over the scout, and we're done. And it's like 45 minutes long. And the intensity level isn't like it is the first three or four weeks of the season. And so a lot of that is to make sure our guys are fresh, healthy, et cetera. Well, that's the recency bias that they have at the end of the season. Then the summer hits and we hammer them again, not hammer them, but then we st- it's like a beginning of a season, but we do it all the time because we don't care if we win or lose games in the summer. It doesn't make any difference. So we continue to go really, really hard you know, at that time, and then we start the season hard. So my point with that is you know, I have to sometimes reframe them and then remind them about the first part of the season. And remember how you <laughs> felt in the summer in June? Remember that? Like two and a half weeks into summer camp and you were like, man, I, I don't know if I can do this anymore. That's what it's like at the beginning. And so that's just a pattern I've noticed. And, uh, and since you asked it like that, that's a pattern I've noticed with, especially with our younger players, they have recency bias meaning that they remember the last month or so of practice and they perceive that we're not going as hard, which is probably true as we did the first month, say, or even the month of the summer that we get together. Um, And so that's something I've noticed. So again, that's part of just dealing with a 15, 16, 17 year old and what they're going to recall, (coughs) 
excuse me, and then what they're going to say they think they need. And so, you know, that's the biggest thing. No one's really, you know, knocked me off my seat with what they've said, um, to be honest with you. And, and because we meet with our players, not so much, but because I have constant communication with them, usually I don't get really knocked off my seat by stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, clearly, I think one of the things anybody who's listened to our series of podcasts knows that you have a pretty good pulse on what's going on with your team at any given time with your individual guys just because you're in constant communication with them. And as a result, they're not going to be bringing you something that is a complete surprise that comes out of left field. You're like, whoa, I, you know, I had no idea that that was what was going on. So that makes sense. Hey, coaches. Excited to talk about Coach's Mirror from Teams of Men. It's a game changer for your team's film analysis, blending Kip Ione's coaching expertise with AI. Short on time or staff, this is for you. Send in a game or up to five and get back a detailed report. We're talking tendencies, strategies, even what opponents might use against you. It's like finding the other team's scouting report in your gym. And here's a bonus. Intrigued by AI and scouting? Grab our free 10-prompt PDF sheet at teamsofmenmembership.group slash coachmirror. It's a quick download and a great start to revolutionizing your season review. Don't miss out, coaches. Head to our site and see how Coaches Mirror can transform your game analysis. Catch you there. Talk a little bit about your own that self-reflection, yeah. how you how you like to kind of wrap up the season in, in your the own mind and then prepare. The self-reflection is a lot more I don't say it's a lot, it's, it's not more difficult, but there's a lot more responsibility because I take that on myself to, as best I can, meet the needs of everybody in the program, which includes assistant coaches, which includes managers, which includes parents, which includes booster club members. I mean, all of that. So, you know, the self-reflection is is almost constant, but at the end of the year, especially you know, like a year we had this year where we're ranked in the top five. Um, We didn't have a normal expectations at the beginning of the season because we were so young and people thought, well, that's kind of a rebuild. They got some new guys. But then by the end, everybody was like, okay, yeah, it's pretty much Bolingbroke (laughs) as normal. Um, Even though we still had those young guys and all of those, those things remain true. Same team as the, at the beginning of the season at the end, but the expectation changes. Yes. Yes. And so, We've kind of created a monster that way. So it, it's always a balancing act for me to keep perspective of what we did that was really, really special. And it, I I said this to some of our guys in the postseason meeting, and I will say it again at the banquet in front of everybody. You know, if you would have told me at the beginning of the season we would win 28 games, we would have two All-State players, we would, you know, beat – you know, we went on the road and beat a 23-0 and team. We beat the number one team in the state at their place. You'd have told me all of those things were going to happen this season. I would have signed up for that immediately at the beginning of the season. And then, you know, it gets to the end of the season and you lose to a top five team in the uh, sectional final. And you're super disappointed just because of how uh, you've, you know, come together as a group. You've played together. You've kind of gone beyond expectations and those types of things. So, you know, my self-reflection is always how can I meet the needs of those people in my charge? And I I don't mean like I'm the boss of them. I just mean, you know, I, I liken it to there's this big ship of Bolingbrook basketball and I'm the little rudder on the on the backside. But if the little rudder on the backside isn't pointed in the right direction, that thing is going to go aground. And it's going to be a disaster. But if the rudder on the backside knows what it's doing, it can prevent a lot of those problems. And we can have smooth sailing for the most part with a bunch of waves in there. But if if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, we're going to we're going to crash and it's going to be like the Titanic. And so that's the analogy I use a lot of the time. So it may seem like Sometimes I'm not doing much or whatever, but that rudder is a little bit off. Then we're going, we're going down. <laughs> and so, you know, <laughs> my job is to meet the needs of the people that I deal with on a daily basis. And like I said, that includes everybody. 
mostly the players, but certainly includes the assistant coaches, the managers, everybody under my uh, charge. But what do you think about when it comes to your assistant coaches? Do you think about roles that they have? Do you think about how you've utilized them yeah. over the course of the season to maximize what they can do? What do you think about when it comes to sort of that analyzing your staff yeah. and kind of wh- how that year went for them? I think am I utilizing what they do best and then not only utilizing but maximizing what they do best for what the team's needs are. And so, you know, we'll, we'll call some timeouts and then I'll let one of my assistants go in and tell them what we're running. Um, and, you know, I'll just stand at the score table and talk. If it's a home game, talk to our scores people because I know them. <laughs> and people are right. like, wow, I, I don't, I can't believe you do that. And well, so my concern with that is, is that assistant comfortable going into those timeouts or is he thinking, geez, Rose is so lazy. He doesn't even want to go on the time because I'll, I'll go in there and I'll certainly do it, but I want them to feel like they have not only voice, but that they are capable of doing things that a head coach does and preparing them to be a head coach. And so then when I meet with them at the end of the season, that's usually the first thing I ask them. Are you comfortable or were you comfortable with this? Do you want less responsibility, more responsibility? Did you think it was too much, too little? What do you think? And then we'll obviously come back to how the team played and, you know, what they can do to serve the team. And all of those things will come up as well. But my first thing is, am I utilizing them and then maximizing what they're doing for the benefit of the team? And so how we do it with my assistants is I have kind of a defensive coordinator, I have an offensive coordinator, and then I have a third assistant who kind of does a little bit of both. He kind of just, he keeps me organized. He just, he kind of does whatever needs to be done um, that that I need. So, you know, that's kind of how we break it down. And my assistants are really, really, really good. In fact, this year I missed three games because of my dad's passing. And so, we didn't miss a beat. They went three and oh, not that that matters that they went three and oh, but like they just carried on, you know, without me. And I think that's a testament to where our program is as well because they didn't need me there. And so, um, I I think that's another testament to where our program is, how comfortable our players are with our assistants and how comfortable the assistants are doing what they need to do. It's like being a parent, Rob, you raise your kid and, you want them to go out into the world and be able to survive without you. So you want your program to be able to survive without you and do what it does. And clearly, if you've put those expectations in place and you have the right people in the right spots, then it's possible for that to continue. I know that one of the things that I think about that, I think you said it to me on our very first podcast together, and we were talking about delegating. And you said something to the effect of, when I was a young coach, I wanted to do everything. And I kind of agreed with you in the sense of, I think if you're somebody who cares about your craft, you kind of feel like I'm the best guy for the job, no matter what the job is. And so you kind of want to have your hand in every single thing that's happening. <laughs> and you told me that as you matured as a coach and that you had been there longer, that you found yourself delegating more and more and more. And you felt like the more you delegated that the better the program was becoming and the better, not necessarily the better coach you were, but just the better program you were running because you had delegated things and didn't have to micromanage every aspect of it. And that's something that I've cited that, particular story a bunch of times on podcasts because I think it really speaks to sort of the lessons that you learn along the way. Because I think as a young coach, it's really, really, really hard to delegate in that way because you don't yet know who you are and you're not yet comfortable with all the facets of what it takes to be a head coach. But obviously, once you've done it for a number of years, and especially when you've done it at the same place, and so you have all those things in, in, in 
where they need to be, then you feel comfortable delegating. And so I think that's what I hear you saying. And I think that when I think about your program, I, I think the rudder example, or just again, the CEO of the, of the thing where you're not maybe necessarily in every nitty gritty detail, but you have somebody who is watching every one of those yeah. nitty gritty details. It's that you've trained those people to be able to do that so that they can use their expertise and you don't have to be on site for every single thing that happens, if that makes sense. I don't know if I'm summarizing yeah. correctly kind no. of what you said, but that's, I, I that's how that's, I remember it. That's exactly correct. And I'll tell you another thing that I tell people all the time. My job as the head coach is to make sure that all the players are coached, not to coach all the players. And that goes from our varsity group all the way down to our freshmen. So it's it's just a kind of shift in thinking, right? Uh, even the, the 15 varsity kids um, that, that practice with me every day. My job isn't to coach all of them. My job is to make sure they're all being coached. And so that's just a shift in philosophy, I guess. And it's a shift um, that I've been able to make gradually. But now, uh, you know, some people would say I'm too far the other way. I mean, you, if you came to a practice, Mike, you and I would stand there. And talk right. off to the side yeah. while the practice was going. And I would stand with you for almost the entirety of the practice. And so, you know, that's what happens when college coaches come. That's what happens when college coaches don't come. It's not like when you're not there, then I'm just jumping in and doing out. That's not how it is. So, you know, my job is to observe and to get everybody that's there what they need to be successful. And then obviously it first starts with the players, but that includes the assistant coaches, the managers and everybody that's in the gym. And then it's also my job to make sure that that same thing is happening at our sophomore practices and at our freshman practices. And that's much harder because, you know, we have, you know, three or four assistants at the varsity level with 15 guys. And then we have two freshman coaches for 20 kids. So you know, it's a, it's a little bit tougher task with them than it is with us. Um, but that's the way that the, that we tier our system and the way we kind of work with our players as they, as they get older. So I think our, when we started to be ultra successful is when I started to give up a lot of that control. I, I wasn't trying to do everything. I wasn't trying to show everybody that I knew everything. Now it's the exact opposite. Like, you know, people will come up to me after like, I love how you let your assistants go into the timeouts, you know, and, you know, now we win so that that helps. So it looks good if we were losing and then I let my assistants do it, it probably would be an opposite thing. Like, right, I can't right. believe he makes his assistants go in there and they're down 20. <laughs> so, um, you know, I get this at clinics too sometimes. Well, that's easy for you because you've won at a really high rate and you've been there for a long time and you have really good players, which is all true. Um, but it didn't start off like that. <laughs> when I got there, that was not happening. And so right. just like our players evolve, you know, I evolve a as a coach. And I do so much more now by feel than by plan, if that makes sense. So you know, our first two weeks or so of practice, for example, I'll be down to the minute. But by the time you get to January, I'll have like one or two things that I want to get accomplished on a scratch sheet of paper. And that's it. The rest, I just go by feel. I go by, I feel how things are going. I see what I think we need. I know what I want to work on. And then we do that. And I talk to my assistants about it. And then we literally just, you know, hey, let's, let's do this, this, and this. And then, then we're out of there. So um, I think I've just evolved as a coach uh, throughout the years, and it's never perfect, and it's never exactly what everybody needs. But you know, I, I do a lot on feel now for sure. Yeah, there is a lot of I think growing and developing. I think back to when I first was a varsity assistant coach, and that was my second coaching job after I had coached a couple of years of JV basketball, and I remember in the early year two three maybe of coaching when our head coach would step out into the coach's office to take a phone call or walk out in the hallway and i was kind of left in charge i could feel 
the intensity and the the tempo of that practice change. Yeah. That all of a sudden head coach isn't there. And now coach cleansing's in charge. And it's just not the same. And then yep. eventually, and again, I can't point to a moment or a reason or what it was, but at some point that changed where the head coach steps out, isn't there, has parent teacher conferences, and suddenly yeah. I'm running the practice and it feels exactly the same. And there's no yeah. difference. And that's something that again, you don't, I think, walk in the door both from a head coach's perspective and from an assistant coach's perspective, you don't walk in the door knowing how that works or how that's going to feel yes. or if you're going to be able to do it. It's something yep. that I think evolves over time. You're There's not no going to get that in year one. You're not going to get yes. it in year one. Let's put it that way. And people have asked me and I've been offered other jobs and I don't know if I have the time or the patience and I'm certain that the administration and the parents don't have the patience for me to do that all again. Whereas where I'm at now, I, I don't want to say I have that because you can lose it and like tomorrow. But, you know, we've built up some sweat equity, if you will, with the players, the parents, the community, the administration, all of that. And it took us years to do that. <laughs> and so you know, there's a certain level of expectation, but that's what we want. And, you know, it's a do it all place and we have to do it all. And so, um, you know, it's, it's just been a good mesh point between my personality, the players, the community and all of those things. And I don't know if it would work necessarily at another high school or another place because maybe my personality doesn't work with, with those, you know, at another school with a different type of culture or different type of whatever. Um, and so, you know, I'm not um, naive to that, to that fact. And I understand that, you know, this might be the only place where I could be a really, really good head coach. Now I'd like to think I could do it anywhere, but it would take some time and some, you know, years to, to get it to where I've, where we've got it here. Yeah. Circumstance, right? I mean, yes. you can go and, Think about the NBA or the NFL draft, yes. <laughs> where players end up, and whether yes. or not uh, what their career looks like, and how different it would be if they ended up in situation A versus situation B. And I think, no question, clearly, when you're, it t it takes time. No matter where you are, it takes time to establish who you are, what you're about, get the right people in the right places, and then get those people to understand what your vision is, and then. You can be in position, as you described, with a really good analogy that you can be the rudder of the ship. And that can yep. be a gigantic ship, and you're just a tiny rudder on the back. But man, if you get off two inches off course and yep. that thing keeps Things pointing two inches yes. off course, it, you, yeah. you end up you end up in a really bad place yes. at some point if that if you never self-correct and get that thing in the right place. So I, it's, you know, again. As as you well know, and as everyone in our audience knows, coaching, there's a fine line as far as how you get things done and what that looks like. And the best coaches, I think, when you describe doing it by feel, it, it's, it, it's a level of experience. It's a level of understanding of your players. It's a level of understanding of your coaching staff. And all that's done through constant communication and awareness and just having your having your finger on the pulse yes. of your team and your program and it's not again we i think i think sometimes we make it sound like oh it's easy we you know we can you know anybody anybody can do that yeah and it's 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 hard it's hard it takes a lot yes. of work it takes a lot of time it takes a lot of investment no and I, I think that you know is it's it's interesting to to sit in the stand sometimes as a parent and listen to conversations and you just uh, people don't necessarily have a very good understanding of yeah. what it takes to run a successful program to be yeah. a successful coach and you know i think all the little all the little things that are i don't even know what i would call them tricks of the trade but just the, yeah. the little things of bits of experience that you learn that help you to be able to have the success those things, you don't have those things on day one. You develop them over no. time. Exactly. You're exactly right. And it's, it's difficult 
to get everyone to understand that. And you never get everybody to understand that. But I, I say to our guys and I said, you know, after we lost in the sectional final, like, you know, people outside of this locker room don't know because they're not here with us. They don't understand it because they can't feel what we feel because they haven't been here. They see Friday night and Saturday night and Tuesday night. That's all they see. And the expectation is that we're machines and we're not machines. We're humans and our, you know, our feelings play a part into it. And as much as we like to say we're tough and that we can compartmentalize <laughs> and all of that stuff. And we can do that to a certain extent. So I'm not against or any of that or saying that that doesn't exist. All I'm saying is the people that really know what we go through and what we need are the people in this locker room. And that's why it's not that we lost that, you know, is the sad part. The sad part is that it's over and it's, there's, we're not going to meet like this group again, ever. It's, it's never going to be like it was yesterday ever again. And so if we would have won, we would have had three or four more days or maybe five more days, depending on when we lose the next game, you know, of this. And that's what you want. And to our guys' credit, I mean, we we would could have had five more days to the season, but there's only four more teams that got more days than we got. And so, um, you know, we we pride ourselves in that, but it hurts not so much because you lost, but it hurts because it's over. And that's what you want – as a coach to feel from your guys. And um, that's because they know that it's not going to be like it has been really ever again, because the team won't be like this again. Sure. And I think that you realize when you get to our age, again, how fleeting that is and yeah. how valuable that time as a high school athlete, as a high school team, as one team for one season to be able to spend that time together with your teammates, the coaches, everybody. I think, man, as you look back on it at this point in our lives, how special that is. And obviously when you're coaching a team, you can look at each individual team and think about how special this group was and that group was and yep. the connections that they had. And there's, there's really nothing better. And the honest truth is there are very, very few teams that, get to end their season with wins compared right. to the number of teams that have to end yep. their season with losses. And no matter what point you end up taking that loss, it always, it always hurts because as you said, yep. it's not the same and that right. group's not going to be together in the same form and fashion that had been before. And so you, if you've built those bonds with your teammates and with your team as a coach, yeah, that, that hurts. And it's, it's something that everybody has to, has to learn how to deal with and figure out. No question. Yep. Pro skills basketball is the nation's premier club basketball organization building a European style youth basketball Academy and is looking for the top basketball leaders in major U S cities to become our next city directors. Specifically pro skills is looking for women and men of high character and grit who see the problems in youth basketball and want to join an elite team focused on a singular mission to change the culture of youth basketball. This job typically begins as a part-time position with the desire and expectation from both the city director and pro skills that together they will build it up to eventually support a full-time city director position. If you're interested in learning more or applying, please visit proskillsbasketball.com slash jobs. All right. So NCAA tournament, when this goes up, we will be in the midst of the sweet 16. So I threw a topic out at you. What is your favorite memory of yeah. the NCAA tournament? So I don't know if you have one yeah. that stands out above all, if you have several, but just throw something at me and then I'll throw I something a, back yeah. at you. I have a couple. And for, for anybody that knows where I'm from, you'll, you'll get this. And for anybody that doesn't know where I'm from, you might not get this, but it's, it's okay. I got, I have actually two NCAA moments. The first one in number one is in, in 2010 when Northern Iowa beat Kansas, the Ali for Oak Manesh three 
I graduated from Northern Iowa. I'm from Cedar Falls. So um, where the University of Northern Iowa is, you know, I had just gotten the Bolingbrook job, I think, a year or two before. Um, and, you know, to be quite honest with you, when Ali shot that ball, we were up one with 30 seconds to go. And I thought, what are you doing shooting that? Like, what are you doing? We're up one. Let's hold it and get fouled. And he shot it. And, he, of course, he made it. And then we beat Kansas. So that's probably number one. But then rewind to 1990. I'm now a junior in high school. Same team, Northern Iowa. Um, we're playing Missouri this time. And Maurice Newby, who was our star guard at that time, hit a three similar to Al- Ali's to put us up five or six against Missouri. I think they were the two seed. We were the 15. And we were watching that in our high school classroom uh, and just went crazy. Um, And so I had known Maurice because I was a player, not at the University of Northern Iowa, but a high school player. And we kind of knew each other from, you know, I was a junior in high school and he was the star player at the local university, all that kind of stuff. So um, that was my first NCAA memory. That's great. And then the Ali for Oakman Nash against Kansas. That's that's my number two. So um, obviously we hope we can make some like tomorrow we have Caleb Thornton is a point guard at Akron. So he's playing against Creighton tomorrow. So hopefully, you know, he'll do something. Joseph Yosefu played at Kansas and they won the national title. He's a player of mine. So, you know, we have uh, former players, former Raider players that have done great things in the tournament as well. So, but my two really great memories are those two Northern Iowa moments. So I got to talk to you about the end of the end of the Akron Kent state game. in the Mac final. Oh, that was heartbreaking, but I wanted Akron to win, but I didn't want them to win like that. No, I mean, it's, that's one of those cases where obviously Kent's my alma mater. So I was rooting for them. I I know both, both coaches of both of those programs really well. And to have a game end on for anybody who didn't see it. So Kent state down one scores with six seconds to go. Akron inbounds it. Kent goes up one on the shot. Akron inbounds it. And one of the players from Kent doesn't realize that they are now up one. And he fouls with four point, I think 4.8 seconds to go. Yes. Akron comes down, makes mo- both free throws, and then Kent has to go the length of the floor and don't score. And they ended up losing by one. And obviously, that's an opportunity to go to the NCAA tournament. But you just, I mean, heartbreaking for that no kid to, uh, you know, you, you just, anybody who's played the game of basketball and you think about being being that player and you just know that that the hurt of that play is never going to go away. I can guarantee that yeah. that yes. young man's going to be 65 years old one day sitting somewhere and that memory is going to pop into his head and he's still going to be, he's still going to be mad. He's still going to be upset about it. And it's just, man, that was, it was, it was heartbreaking. And again, I was obviously yes. rooting for Kent, but by the same token, you know, it, it was, it's not the way, no matter who you're rooting for, it's not the way you wanted to see no a question. game end. Let's put it, let's put it that way. Let's put it no that question. way. So that was gut wrenching, uh, uh e- on either side, really. Absolutely. All right. So I have a couple that I have, I have two that kind of have a, a personal connection, sort of like what you described. So, so for me, seeing my alma mater, Kent state in 2002, make it to the final eight of yeah. the NCAA tournament and a loss to Indiana away from making it to the final four. When I think about the program that I played in and kind of where we were, and we had some good success when I was there, we went to two NITs. And so, but to to think that the program or the team that I played for could have had a legitimate chance to go to the final four to me was kind of unfathomable. And that year, 2002 happened 10 years after I, graduated so that was a fun run just because you see our alma mater yeah make it to make it to the final eight so that was cool and then the other personal connection i have is back in 1986 when cleveland state beat indiana and 
my dad was a professor at Cleveland State, so I had grown up kind of with Cleveland State basketball and gone down and uh, watched them play in games where there was me and my dad and my mom and my sister and maybe six other people at various times watching games. And so I kind of yes. I kind of grew up with Cleveland State basketball. And then the guys that were on that yeah. team, eventually as a high school player, because my dad was down at Cleveland State all the time, and I would kind of go down there and try to work my way into some off-season pickup games in the gym with players and just again back when the pickup basketball scene was a lot different and there were yeah. lots of games to be had but so i kind of knew those guys personally and to see that again a program that i had grown up with and watched to suddenly make it to the national stage and to beat indiana and bob knight and you had kevin mackey who was kind of playing that yes. run and stun and running 10 yep. 11 12 guys and just pressing and going up and down and playing almost I guess the antithesis of the way that Bobby Knight's team played at the time. No uh, it was yeah. just a very, again, contrast of styles. And it's really a true, a true back in the day, David, you know, David versus Goliath win for, for Cleveland state. And then they eventually ended up getting knocked out by David Robinson. And I think they yes. were, in, I think they made the, I think they made the final, that might've been the, the final eight, the elite eight, I think that they got to, or maybe yeah. they got knocked out in the sweet 16. I can't remember now, but that was a lot of fun. And then I guess the most iconic moment for me. And when I think about my college basketball fandom, I, I think it probably, when I think about my ages 10 to 17. So for me from like 1980 to 1987, when I was a kid and growing up that's i think when i was just the most into what college basketball yeah. was all about and so the the michael jordan shot against the patrick ewing georgetown yep. boys and obviously michael wasn't michael at the time and nobody knew that he was going to become michael <laughs> but that shot was yeah. kind of a launching pad for no who he became and was kind of the the moment when he announced himself on the national stage but you know that team when you have James Worthy and Sam Perkins and yeah, Matt Doherty and Jimmy Black and that whole group yeah. was just and I think I liked North Carolina before that but that that game that run that team I think really cemented my my Michael Jordan and North Carolina fandom and so I, from from a national perspective from a game that I didn't have any personal stakes in I think to me that's the one that's the one memory of the NCAA tournament that that sticks out. And I can still see, I, I know exactly where I was sitting in my living room watching it when <laughs> yeah. that shot went in. And so it's funny the things that you remember that you equate with no a place. place. There, there aren't that many in life, and that's definitely one of them for me. That's great. I mean, it's amazing how the tournament itself kind of makes those moments happen, I guess you would say. Yes. And, yeah. and a lot of people have those moments. And you know, the, the basketball is, is, does crazy things for all of us. And, you know, it's brought us together and, you know, Absolutely. now we're friends. And so, you know, the basketball has the ability to really connect people and which is the most special thing about the, the whole game. It really is. It's kind of crazy. I've had Matt Doherty from that team on the podcast twice. And if you'd have told, yeah. if you'd have told 12 year old me that, yes. Hey, you know, someday, you're going to interview one of these guys on a podcast. Uh, well, first of all, I would have yeah. not known what a podcast was. But secondly, yeah. I'd have been like, no, there's no way that uh, any of these guys would yeah. ever take time to talk to little old me. And so it's just, yeah, the basketball crazy. definitely has magic in it and what it what it does as far as connecting and relationships and all those things. And you just think about all the crazy shots and buzzer beaters and you it's, could go through a million. Yeah. You could go through a million different things. Uh, uh, that happened and when you think about just how it's on the national stage and you start with 64 yes. teams and i mean you go back to you go back to the bird magic i remember that year bird oh, magic crazy. 79 and pen yeah pen was in the final four that year right. yes which yes i mean it's it's kind of you know it's it's uh, it's unbelievable i remember i was actually at a neighbor's house watching watching the the Michigan State semifinal and just yeah. you know hoping hey I hope, I hope magic gets there to the to the final game and it's there's just so many things that are wrapped up in my it's life crazy. And I'm sure yours when it comes those, to those 
the memories and stuff like you mentioned the Matt Doherty thing. You know, I remember in '88 when Danny Manning led Kansas and Larry Brown's their coach, and then Larry Brown leads the Pistons and all of that stuff. And the, now, fast forward to 2013, and my best player is taking a campus visit to SMU. I'm riding in Larry Brown's car during yeah. the campus visit, and I'm thinking to myself, "What? How did this happen?" <laughs> like I'm a little kid with the Sports Illustrated thing hung up on my bulletin board. And it's got yep. Danny Manning, and then there's Larry Brownson. And now I'm riding in Larry Brown's car, heading yeah. to campus, you know, with him. He's driving. Like, how did this even occur? And so, yeah. you know, it's things like that. Like you mentioned the Matt Door. Like, it's it's amazing where the ball can take you and, and where it, it leads us all to. There's no question. There's no question. It's a lot of fun, and I am thankful every day that my dad, my mom supported me through everything that I did with basketball no as a kid and, and what the game has, has given me. Uh, I can never hope to even come close to, to paying it back, what it's done for me and, and for my life. And so I'm forever appreciative of that. And so this is a fun one, Rob. We got yeah. a lot, uh, we got a lot accomplished. We this got a lot was accomplished. great. Well, I mean, maybe Jason needs to take the next one. No, I'm just yeah, kidding. That was, that was a joke, <laughs> Jason. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> he won't take he won't take any offense. I won't let him. So okay. That's anyway, great. that's great. Rob, thanks for jumping out tonight. Really appreciate it. Triple double number eight is in the books, and we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Your first impression is everything when applying for a new coaching job. A professional coaching portfolio is the tool that highlights your coaching achievements and philosophies. And most of all, helps separate you and your abilities from the other applicants. The Coaching Portfolio Guide is an instructional membership-based website that helps you develop a personalized portfolio. Each section of the Portfolio Guide provides detailed instructions on how to organize your portfolio in a professional manner. The guide also provides sample documents for each section of your portfolio that you can copy, modify, and add to your personal portfolio. As a Hoopheads Pod listener, you can get your Coaching Portfolio Guide for just $25. Visit coachingportfolioguide.com slash hoopheads to learn more. Thanks for listening to the Hoopheads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball.